So I wanted to take a look at a passage today and I've always sort of enjoyed these verses because um, if you've ever made a resume, you try to figure out how to present yourself and, and, and your skills and your talents, or if you've ever been an employer and had to deal with resumes, you're sort of like, okay, what do we have here? I love what Paul does in these verses because basically what we're gonna look at today is the resume of Jesus Christ. Paul just brings this thing together first chapter of the, the book of Colossians was just, just dynamite. And he lays it out quickly and deeply of who Jesus is. So in a nutshell, we are going to be looking at the resume of Christ. And my goal and my desire is those of you that do not know Christ as Savior, that you will consider from the text who he really is. And may the Spirit move you and draw you. And those of you that are saved, may we look at the text today and just stop, take pause and be in awe. To truly be in awe of everything that he is. Um, I know this is, it, it, and this is also a thing too, I think where the church is, is, is failing today because I know over the past, you know, maybe half century in this nation, the, the view of Christianity has, has really changed. And a lot of people sort of point fingers at why that might be. It might be the media, um, evolutionists, a political party, I don't know, aliens, whatever it might be. But it's what's happened to the view of Christianity. Well, me personally, I think before we blame anything else or wonder what's happened here in America with the view of Christianity, we need to look at the evangelical church. Because I think something has, has really gone wrong that instead of preaching straight from the Bible and calling people to repentant faith and, and truly a submission to the supremacy of Christ. The evangelical church has been telling people that, that God's purpose is to make their life great, to make it tension-free, that he wants to, to give them um, uh, 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 a fruitful career and, and a wonderful marriage and, and financial prosperity. Now, it's true that when we come to saving faith and recognize the supremacy of Christ, our lives will change. That is true. Our depth and our love for our spouse will change. Definitely a Holy Spirit thing. We will view prosperity different. No longer will we look at it in terms of the earth, but it will be wrapped up in not only the, the physical, but the spiritual. And we will definitely learn how to deal with the stresses of this world differently. But it seems as though the church today has gone from asking the question, are we living in light of Christ's Lordship to basically what can Jesus do for us today? The church has gone from Christ supreme to my life supreme. And a key reason for this decline definitely is the lack of biblical knowledge and a reverence for Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. The preaching of Christ supreme is critical. Webster's Dictionary defines supreme as highest in rank or authority, or highest degree, highest quality. In essence, there would be none better. The supreme of something is absolutely the ultimate. So what we're talking about here is Jesus, Jesus, the ultimate power, glory, and authority of importance here on earth and in the church. Christ supreme over all is truly developed biblically, but I think the book of Colossians and Hebrews do the best job of developing it. Pastor Kyle preached the book of Hebrews. How long ago was that? Two years ago or so? Yeah, because it took him two years to do Acts. <laughs> Nehemiah? Acts, Hebrews. If you were not part of this church with the book of Hebrews, our website has all of those sermons, I would really, really, really encourage you to go back and to listen to that. But there's a key verse in the book of Hebrews that sort of sets the tone for the entire um, letter. And it's uh, verse one, chapter one, verse three, where it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The truth also, that same truth is also found in the book of Colossians in the second chapter, verse nine, where it says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Essentially, Jesus is supreme because he is God. 
In our text today, Paul makes it clear. Paul makes it clear that Jesus is over all things. But before we read this today, I want to just give you a bit of a background to this letter that Paul wrote. The letter was written to um, the Colossian church and was likely written between AD 58 and 52. Uh, The primary purpose of this letter was to stress the preeminence of Christ, but to stress the preeminence of Christ both in his person and in his work. Paul wrote this letter for two key reasons, to refute false teaching that was going on, and because nothing for the church is more vital than the understanding the power of Christ, the fruitfulness of the Spirit, and having an accurate understanding, a truly accurate understanding of the person and the work of Christ. Without understanding who Jesus really is and what he has accomplished through the cross, people will fall short of deceptive um, uh, religious beliefs. All false systems out there either reject the Bible's teaching about the person of Jesus Christ, that is, his true deity and humanity, or they seek to add something to the work of Christ. They add something to the religious system, okay? Or they'll make a combination of the two. And this was precisely what was going on with the false teachers among the Colossian church. To describe what was going on in just 10, 15 seconds here, in a nutshell, it was a corruption of Christianity with elements of of sort of a mystical and and, and legal Judaism, and really sort of an early uh, set of Gnosticism was taking place there. The false teachers distorted the gospel message by minimizing Jesus, the person and his work. The Colossian church had given Jesus a place in their lives, but they did not recognize him in first place, the first place that he demanded. Jesus was important to them, but he was not paramount. And the trouble was their true understanding of everything that Christ is. So this letter focuses on the solution. What's the solution? It's improving the church's understanding of who Jesus is. When studying this first chapter of the book of Colossians, uh, Martin Luther said this, If anyone stands firm and right on this point, that Jesus Christ is true God and true man, who died and rose again for all of us, all other articles of the Christian faith will fall into place for him and firmly sustain him. So very true is Paul saying that Christ is the chief treasure the basis, the foundation, the sum total of all things in whom and under whom all things gather. He went on to say, in him, all the treasures of world, excuse me, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. And on on the other hand, he said, I have noted that every heir, all heresies, idolatries, offenses, abuses, and ungodliness in the church have originally arisen because this article, part of the Christian faith concerning Jesus Christ, has been despised, lost, or distorted. So what Paul is going to talk about today, where the church has failed and when the church has lost its power and when the church has lost its sight, it's because, in the words of Luther, the church has stepped away and distorted, despised, or lost these critical truths. Our passage today is broken into two natural selections, and I, and I don't think I told Jerry that I'm going to break it into two pieces of reading, but I'm letting you know now, okay? <laughs> Verses 15 through 17 focus on the supremacy of Christ over creation. Christ over creation. And then verses 18 through 13 focus on the supremacy of Christ over the redeemed. So what we have is, in this resume of Jesus, is the first few verses deal with Christ supreme, Christ the creator, Christ God himself. And the second half deals with Christ supreme, the savior, the redeemer, the one that we find our eternal security in. Both pieces point to the supremacy of Christ over all things. Why? Because he is God. So let's start. We're going to start. We're going to read. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, 
in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Now, I was doing adult Sunday school just last week. And those of you that are in that class, we were doing Romans 8. Did any of that sound familiar? If you're in that class, you're going, hey, we just talked. That's right. I love it because scripture supports scripture. There's never a one-time shot. You will see it repeated over and over and over again, the truth of who our Savior is. So our first part here, these uh, 15, 16, 17, these three verses, it is Christ supreme over creation. And this passage really is one of the strongest in Scripture as it relates to the superiority of Christ, God our Savior. In these first few verses, we see four truths about Jesus being the, the foremost of creation. The first we see was in verse 15, where it says, he is the image of the invisible God. He is God, okay? Paul gets straight to the point, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. As the image of the invisible God, Jesus is first of all himself, God. Romans 9, 5, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternal blessed God. The eternal blessed God, Paul said, amen. 2 Corinthians 4.4 uh, 4 says, the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. F.F. F. Bruce said, in him, Christ, the nature and being of God, having been perfectly revealed. And that means Jesus both represents and manifests God to the world. The apostle John expressed it in the first chapter of John. In verses 1, 14, and 18, he said these following things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became the flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Verse 18 saying, He has explained him literally means that Jesus declares or will now illustrate God himself. So if you are going to illustrate God, who must you be? God. And the Jews knew exactly what he was saying because the only one who could illustrate God would be God. God. What was God the father like? What was God the father like? It's, it's, it's incredible for us to sort of, to, to understand this. Um, God the Father. John 5.18 says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, being Jesus. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Again, if you were equal with God, the Jews knew exactly what you were representing, God being God. See, here's the thing is, when the Jews sought to kill him in, in, in chapter five there, Jesus knew what was going on. And if they had mistaken what the point of his words were, he would have easily have corrected them being a devout Jew. He would have said, oh, I'm never, I would never claim to be equal with God if that's not what he meant. But instead, Jesus went on for many verses in chapter five, making claim after claim that only God could make. For example, John 5, 22 through 23, he said, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son so that all who honor the son, even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So God has given all honor to, well, God would only give all honor to God. Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh. And in John 14, 9, Jesus continues by saying, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So when Paul starts this resume of who Jesus is, he starts right off, Boom, out of the park. He's God. That's pretty impressive first point on the resume, huh? Who is this Jesus? God. And we start from there. John's, uh, Pastor Kyle's uh, first uh, sermon from from Hebrews uh, does a great, great job of of laying this out because that part of chapter one is is literally identical to Colossians 1.15. Ultimately, this, what this all means is there is only one way. There is only one way to God, and that is through the person of Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And any teaching, 
any teaching that transpires that, that makes Jesus less than God in human flesh is not the teaching from the words of Jesus Christ himself or from any of Paul's words or the other apostles. Christ alone is preeminent over all the universe because he alone is the image of the invisible God. Second point here that Paul makes, he says, Christ, talking about Christ, Christ is the firstborn over creation. So Jesus is not only God, it says, but he's the firstborn over all creation. The phrase firstborn here is important because you'll see it again in the second part of our passage today, but it's most frequently translated as like the, 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 the heir or the owner. In ancient times, it was meant the ranking one or the supreme one. Jacob, Jacob was not firstborn, but he was the heir or the ranking one. This is strongly supported in, in Psalm 89, 27 in dealing with David, where it says, also, I will make my firstborn the highest of kings uh, of the earth. See, God had appointed David as that representation, as the firstborn. But we know from 1 Samuel that, that David was the youngest of eight brothers. Firstborn for David is therefore a title. It's a title or a position of honor, honor not chronological order. Okay. Christ, the firstborn over creation. Third point here. He's the firstborn over creation, but then the important part with this links to Christ is the creator of all things. And that's found in verse 16. Okay? So Jesus, the exalted preeminent one over all of creation. Because, why? Because he is the creator of all things. He is the creator of all things. Um, Jehovah was witnesses. They seriously distort John chapter 1, and they absolutely mutate this verse too. Verse 16, where it says that he is the creator of all things. They teach that Jesus was a created being, and therefore he cannot be God. The Jehovah's Witness, their, their New World translation, does not say all things in verse 16, but rather all things. Then they add the word other, all other things, even though the Greek manuscripts do not use that. They insert the word other because it's obvious that if Jesus created all things, visible and invisible, that he himself cannot be created. He cannot be created. As John 1, 3 says this about Jesus, all things came into being through him. Apart from him being Christ, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus created all things. Jesus. Jesus is not a mere man. He is the creator of all things. Those things we can see and those things that we cannot even see. But Paul explained that all the thrones here in this passion passage, all dominions, all rulers, all authorities of, of heaven and earth. It's one of those lists where he encompasses everything of both the visible and invisible world are under the authority of Christ. And there's a really a lot to this thought because you know how Paul just packs it in, just boom, 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 boom. But Paul brings it up to refute specifically the teaching that was going on there at this time in regard to angels and their authority. Paul's saying that all created beings, no matter what realm they belong to, fall under Christ's authority. Why? Because he created all of them. And therefore, nothing should be exalted except for the creator. Because creatures are the created subject of the creator, Jesus Christ. See, if Christ created them, Paul is saying that everything, everything falls under the rule of the creator. Therefore, stop, take pause to the Colossians. Do not look to anything else in any realm, but look to the creator himself, Jesus Christ. We know what various churches have done, deflecting prayer to different places, different focuses. This is what was going on there. But it wasn't to saints, it was to angels. Angels are created beings by the creator. Why worship a created being when you should be worshiping that which created all beings? You with me? That's a pretty impressive resume that Paul's laying out for us here. Okay, it's also important to know that Jesus was not only the creator, but Paul lets us know that he provides the purpose for his creation. I think it's pretty cool. It's not just, huh, created, 
but then the creator is still the purpose and the focus, the one to be glorified by his creation. Our Lord did not just create and let be. He created for it all to glorify him. Okay, That's why Paul said all things were created through him and for him. Paul's saying that the Son is not only the one whom all things owe their origin as, as the divine cause, but Christ is also the goal. The goal of the existence of everything that he created. All right, we're talking to the church. Is Christ the goal of you, his creation? Paul's pointing right there to these folks as they're looking to, to, to other things. Okay? It's important because the goal of creation, plain and simple, according to Scripture, is to glorify Christ. That's why Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you, by, excuse me, and by your will they existed and were created. We are to glorify him and him alone. Fourth point. Paul tells us that Christ holds all things together. Boy, I am glad about that. Because, man, this world, more often than not, does not make sense. Okay? To hold things together is to present something, of course, to, from falling apart or being in complete disorder. Remember, Christ is before all things, both in time and rank. Jesus existed before everything else, and he declared in, in, in John 8, 58, he declared this. He said, before Abraham was born, I am, and I am points back to being God. He's not only the creator of the world, he is the structure that keeps everything together. By him, everything came to being, and by him, everything continues to be. That would mean the unity the order, the adaptation of, of everything in, in nature and in history can be traced to the upholder and sustainer of all things. Christ, here, the creator. New Testament scholar uh, Douglas Moo said it this way, what holds the universe together is not an idea or a virtue, but a person, the resurrected Christ. Without him, electrons would not continue to circle in uh, nuclei, Gravity would cease to work and the planets would not stay in their orbits. Moo goes on to explain that the Colossian uh, heretics were probably telling people that they needed to find truth by pursuing elements of their teaching. But Moo says, Paul wants them to understand that things make sense only when Christ is kept at the center. Aha, no wonder things don't make sense out there to the world because Christ is not the center. If we understand he is creator, sustainer, and the object that man should be glorifying, chaos would stop, self would take a back seat to the preeminence of who Christ is. So Paul wraps up this first point, the supremacy of Christ over creation in verse 17, and he starts a new thought here in verse 18. Here he talks about the supremacy of Christ over the redeemed. So let's read verses 18 through 23. Paul says, talking about Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Again, the resume of Jesus Christ here over the redeems, being, being the redeemer. So Paul goes, who is this? Boom, creator, redeemer. Verse 7, 15 through 17 says, Jesus takes first place as the creator over everything in the cosmos. Here in verses 18 through 23, he tells us Jesus takes first place over the redeemed. In particular, Paul uses the word the church, okay? Because that's the body of church universal, the body of believers. In verse 15 through 17, he says he's Lord over everything he has made. 
And here at the end, he says he's Lord over everyone he has saved. He's Lord over everyone he has saved. So the focus shifts from the old, sort of the natural creation, to the new, the spiritual creation. That is, Christ the creator to Christ, the reconciling God. And it's in these verses here that we see three distinct things regarding Jesus being preeminent over redemption. In verse 18, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is, the first one, is head of his body. Head of his body means head of the church. Scholars debate the source of Paul's concept of the church as the body of Christ. But F.F. F. Bruce says, it may well have been Paul's first encounter with the risen Savior on the road to Damascus in Acts 9.4 when he heard the Lord say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, Saul was an avid, young, up-and-coming Jewish leader. He thought he was persecuting the church. But Jesus said, you are persecuting him, identifying him as the one over the church. To combat the Colossian uh, heresy here, Paul asserted that Christ is the head of his body, the church, to set forth his supreme authority over it. And it's important. The word head here means that Jesus is the authority or the absolute source of the church. Only Jesus qualifies to be the head of the church. And therefore, the members of the body must submit to the sovereign head. The analogy here of, of, of Jesus being that the head brings many things to mind. Think, the body, excuse me, the head gives the body the ability to produce growth and without it, the body would die. Just as the head and the body are inseparably joined, so we are united with Christ in that exact same way. We, the body, without Christ the head, what happens to the church? Well, just look what's happened to most of the church out there in America today. Without Christ as the head, does the body look like the Bible says the body of believers should look like? Absolutely not. Just as the human body has many members with different functions, and yet it is so with the body, the body of Christ. Just as the physical body is dead if separated from the head, so the body of Christ must draw its life from Christ and depend upon Christ as its head. Unfortunately, many churches seem to have forgot this. If Jesus is not supreme in the church, then literally there is no church. That was part of the trouble that was going on with the Colossian church. They had lost the connection to the head. They had lost the connection to Christ. And as a result, they were sort of experimenting with all sorts of false doctrines. And if you start to experiment with false doctrines, you definitely start to fall into sin issues. Okay. Um, they were experimenting. And in Matthew 16, um, 18, it's really sort of important because this is the focus that the Colossian church lost and definitely the church that we have lost here in America. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. See, here's the thing is, Christ originated the church. Rather, it was, it was a creation of, of him and not of the apostles. Okay, we can talk about, okay, you know, Peter, a foundation of the early church. Yes, absolutely. But Christ says, I will build my church. He is the foundation. And this is going to be important as Paul wraps up his letter in remembering this. See, here's the thing. Here at Faith Community Church, uh, we are led by uh, a board of elders. Pastor Kyle is, is our preaching pastor. Um, at FCC, Jesus has to be the head of the church. Has to be. Or it becomes a man thing. It cannot be Pastor Kyle. It cannot be the elders. First and foremost, we must be obedient to the head who is Christ. This is Christ's church, not the church of man. Jesus is supreme over this church, and we must bow before his authority. I know that's the reason why you come to this church, is the authority of the word. It is preached well here. I'm not talking about myself. It is preached well here, and there's a reason we need it. There's a reason we need it for our growth, for salvation. The truth of the message has to get out for the lost to be saved. And for the saved to grow, we have to keep Christ as the head. If it becomes about man, 
get out of here. A lot of us left churches for that reason, yeah? Okay? We must be doing that. Jesus is supreme over the church and we must bow before his authority. Second thing Paul says here about Christ in this situation is he's the firstborn from the dead. Because of his, his resurrection, the believer will have a physical death, yes, but spiritually will never die. Die no more. Christ laid a foundation for the sanctified life and the assurance that we all will rejoice in. That's why in John 14, 19, Jesus says, because I live, you will live too. Because I live, you will live too. Christ as the firstborn from the dead. See, here's that term again, firstborn. It's the ranking order. Because of the supreme leader in redemption and afterlife, the controller of it all, Christ, it points to his resurrection as the first of its kind. It is going to be the supreme and the one that unlocks it for all of his children. Although other resurrections did happen from the dead and are reported in scripture, all of these people once again died. The resurrection of Christ is indestructible and it is not subject to aging or death. The result of Christ being the beginning, as Paul said, the firstborn from the dead is so that he himself will come to have first place for eternity. He will have first place for eternity. He is the pathbreaker. He is the authority over life here on earth as described before and life eternal for all of his because jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead philippians 2 9 through 11 says for this reason also god highly exalted him being jesus and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that the name of jesus by the name of jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth under earth and the every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of the father so God the Father gave the authority to God the Son, God in the flesh, that every knee will bow, heaven, earth, and under, to the supremacy of Christ. And Paul is just laying this out for the believers in this church and for our church today to grab hold of, to hang on to, to be in awe when we're, when we're troubled, when we're shaken, when when we're, we're challenged by the things and understanding, we go back to the supremacy of Christ in creation and as redeemer. The third thing we see here that identifies the supremacy of Christ over the redeemed is that Jesus is the only source. He is the only source of reconciliation with God. Again, who is Christ? Who he is has everything to do with how one can be reconciled with God. This is the great question. Whenever you talk with somebody, you might evangelize. You, it's a simple thing like, do you believe in heaven? And you sort of start that route. Yep, how does one get there? Da -da 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 -da. Paul's saying it right here. Creator, redeemer. If he created it, he redeems it. He is the only link to heaven. Okay? In verse 19, we see that. It gives God the Father. It says, great joy and pleasure to have all of his fullness dwell in in Jesus. That is, it greatly pleased the Father for the Son to have the preeminence over creation and the church. That means preeminence over the redeemed. He is the source and to have the preeminence. Because Paul uses a few words here or phrases that are important in the fullness when he talks about of God dwelling in him. See, it's not around Jesus. This isn't some mystical thing like some man and some aura came around him. It's not upon him or, or under him. Rather, it is in him. It dwells in him. The word dwell means to take up residence and points to the incarnation. It is used in the sense of the permanent dwelling of God and would remind believers of God's desire to choose a place for his name to dwell like the Old Testament had talked about. Again, we had talked about that. I mentioned it before in Colossians 2, 9, for Christ is all the fullness, all the fullness and deity of God that lives in bodily form. The phrase all the fullness is really a technical term. It's meant to sum up uh, the total of all the divine powers and attributes of God. Okay? All the fullness. That means Christ is not a, a partial version. All the fullness. Paul uses this term eight different times, all the fullness of God 
in speaking of Christ, uses it eight different times in the book of Colossians to show the believers that Jesus is the fullness of God and no one else. The fact that it pleased the Father to have all the fullness dwell in Christ is proof that Jesus Christ is God. John 1.16 says, From the fullness of His grace we have all received one blessing after another. And because Jesus is the Christ, starting in verse 20, Paul tells us that as people come to saving faith in Christ and are reconciled to, to the Lord through the blood of Christ, they become members of His church which he is the head. See, the false teachers among the Colossians were teaching people that they could get closer to God through other things. I mean, this is like the stuff that goes on here today in America. I want to draw closer to God. How? Okay, how? Well, the Colossian church was being told by these false teachers by, by worshiping angels and by observing certain rules and regulations they could draw closer to God. But they were also told that they could not be promised of total and complete reconciliation. And that's important. The de dictionary defines reconciliation as the restoration of friendship and fellowship after um, estrangement. It also means to change thoroughly from one position to another. See, reconciliation happens when someone or something is completely altered or adjusted so that the relationship has peace again. And see, Paul establishes this, that <clears throat> our reconciliation to the Father in heaven only can happen through Jesus Christ. Nothing else can bring that reconciliation. Good deeds, giving money to something, positive thinking, none of it can bring reconciliation. Now, Paul establishes four elements here about the reconciliation through Christ, and it's really important. Paul gives us the focus. The focus is to reconcile to himself. The focus is always about God and reconciliation to him. Who needed to be adjusted and changed? Us or God? Us. Reconciliation to him, to bring his, but an altering and a changing had to happen. The initiative and action must come from him, through him. Paul also talks to the scope, the scope of this reconciliation. He says all things. Reconciliation, he talks about, involves the whole universe. God's going to reconcile. God's going to bring all things to him in order and purpose. We know the book of John talks about sheep and goats. In the reconciliation, everything will lay out according to sovereign God. God has called you being reconciled to him as his child, John calls us sheep. The result, the result of this reconciliation is to bring peace and order. And the peace and order only comes through Jesus Christ. And our hostility can then end. Because Paul says in here, we were hostile or we were once enemies. And the means, the only means for this reconciliation, the only means for peace is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, and of course, then the resurrection. Salvation is only through the sacrificial death of Christ and the payment by his blood of our sins. There's an interesting thing that takes place here in, 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 in verse 21, because Paul moves from the general to the specific. Paul reminds us what we were like before experiencing peace with God. He says that we were alienated. He uses the word alien to refer to the fact that we were all once strangers or outsiders. That's to remind us that apart from the grace of God, found in Jesus Christ, everyone is estranged. Paul also says we are enemies. We are not just alienated. The Bible says that we were actually hostile, actively hostile to God. Now, I do distinctly remember who I was before Christ. And I would say, I wasn't shaking my fist at, but if I look at scripture, I was shaking my fist at God in everything that I did. We were at war with God. As Romans 8, 7 says, the mind of sinful man is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. This is one of the amazing facts of the gospel, that despite our alienation and our hostility, God himself took the initiative and took the action. That's why Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What did I do? To be saved. 
I was dead in my sins and transgressions. But yet, while I was a still sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't say, David, make a move. Clean yourself up a little bit, and then I'll do it. Dead. But born again because of the blood of Christ. And by his grace, he awakened me to see the truth. We must not miss the fact that Paul says that we are reconciled through Christ's physical body and its death. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to pay the price, but it had to be the unblemished one. In 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. Paul says the purpose behind the pleasure of the Father and the reconciliation to the Son is to present saved sinners, to present saved sinners in heaven for all eternity. Isn't that awesome? The purpose of the reconciliation is so that God presents the bride to the bridegroom. Dun, dun, dun. Isn't that amazing? Me, you, if you're saved by grace through faith, to be presented for all eternity. The word present here that Paul used was used when someone inspected a potential sacrifice to God uh, before offering it to him. In the same sense, the word was used in, in Romans 12, 1, when referring to Christians presenting their body to God as a living sacrifice. Because of what Jesus uh, did on the cross, dying on the cross, he is both the sacrificer and the justifier so that our sins can be forgiven and we can be declared righteous by a holy judge, God himself. So, Look at the results of Christ's work. Paul says that through Christ, we are, he uses the word holy in his sight. We are set apart holy and declared holy by God. Not by anything we did, but by the work of Christ and our faith in him. Paul also says here that we're without blemish. This word applies to the temple sacrifices, which had to do with something being free from any faults or, or, or blotches or, or blemishes. When God looks at a believer because of what Christ has done. He sees no blemishes. Because y'all, I got blemishes and so do you. But because of Christ, washed clean. Washed clean for eternity. When God looks at a believer because of Christ, he sees no blemishes. And the last one here, okay? The last one, and I love this, is it's, it's above reproach. Free from accusation. It's a legal term which literally means not to be called in, not to be called in. No charge of condemnation because of what Christ has done. Our sentence of eternal death, uh, uh, can, no sentence of eternal death can be brought against a believer in the, decor, the court of divine justice. Paul's emphasis here is on a holy standing before God today and forever. The promise of this kind of perfection for those who in the church the Colossians was, they thought through some secret and mystical thing, okay? In essence, Paul's saying, you, the believer, if you have perfect, if, if you believe you have perfect standing with Christ, now and forevermore, you are holy in his sight, without blemish, free from any accusation. You have everything you need in Christ, okay? The last thing I, I really wanted to bring up here, it's, it's really important in verse 23, Okay? And it all falls in line. Paul mentions something here that can be a little confusing where he says, if you remain in the faith. Ah, okay? The if clause does not mean that a believer can, can lose their faith. Okay? This doesn't mean like, if you remain saved. No, Scripture is very clear. Jesus literally says that all those that the Father have given to me, I will keep. All those that he have drawn. Romans 8 says... For all that he predestined, he called. If he called you, he will justify you. And if he justifies you, he will glorify you. If God himself called you and awakened you, he saved you. And if he saved you, you are cleansed and seen without blemish. And if he cleansed you and sees you without blemish, you will be glorified. You will go to heaven. Done. Done done. See, here's the thing is, it would, this would translate more what Paul's saying is, if indeed you continue in the faith, and I believe you will. Paul talks about this in other things. If you are part of us, you're going to continue. 
Okay? This is how the word is used in, in Colossians 3.1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above Christ. If you have been raised by Christ, if you are the redeemed, you're going to continue to seek Christ. That's why this resume of Jesus Christ here that Paul lays out is so important. I know I'm saved, but I lose my focus sometimes. Do you? Absolutely. Paul puts this back in front of the believer to say, be in awe. Remember who this is to help us to continue that growth and that sanctifying process. Okay? That is the amazing call. And here's the thing. He is literally saying, if you're truly saved, the foundation is built on Christ. And if it's built on Christ, it is solid for eternity. Okay? So, Christ supreme in creation and in redemption. Christ supreme in creation and redemption. Paul, uh, John MacArthur, excuse me, uh, hits the, this at the head. He says, the biblical mandate for both sinners and saints is to make Christ is not to make Christ Lord, but rather to bow to his lordship. He is ever and always Lord, whether or not anyone acknowledges it, his lordship, his lordship is always and consistent. Whether you surrender or not, his lordship is what it is. He is creator and redeemer. If you are saved by grace through faith, take the words of Paul. I pray it would, would, would encourage you and have you, I hate to use the word inspire because everybody just sort of uses that word, but invigorate you of, oh my goodness, Christ is amazing. And if you are not saved by grace through faith, my prayer literally is regularly for people that come to this church that do not know Christ as Savior, that literally you will consider, you will ponder, and may the Holy Spirit draw you to the truth of the love and peace that is only found through the Creator and Redeemer, and that is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise your name and we give you all glory. And Heavenly Father, I just pray here that the words that your Spirit gave Paul to write, that we would truly reflect upon these, that we would meditate upon it. Lord, if there is anyone here that does not know Christ as Savior, may your Spirit enlighten them, awaken them to the truth of the love and reconciliation that is found only through God in the flesh, the Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, and for those that are your children, are the church, Lord, may, may we not become a weak and faint, but Lord, may your scripture bring life and strength to us. May we live for your glory because everything that you created is to bring glory to your name. May that be so with us here at Faith Community Church. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.